Last week we finished chapter 17 of John. Chapter 17 of John is where Jesus prayed. He prayed for himself, Lord, I want to be sanctified. I want to be set apart in your eyes. I want to be glorified in you. I want you glorified in me. That's the prayer of Jesus, and that should be the prayer of every saint in this room. God, I want you busting forth in power out of me, man. I want, when I walk down the street, I want people to see Jesus. When I'm at work, I want them to see Jesus. When I'm out there on the street, I want them to see Jesus. When I'm at home, in my own private chambers, I want my family to see Jesus in me, man. I don't want to be two-faced. I don't want to be this guy who's got this Jesus face at church. And then be a thief and a rebel and a redneck and a liar and a scammer behind everybody's back. You see, that's the majority of Christian in the world today. There's Christians where I work who are Christian, 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 and they're always trying to get away with something. Oh, if, 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 boy, if I had a headset like yours, I'd be listening to music all day long. You know, the rule at my work says you can't be listening to music while you're working. You know, a rule at my work says you can't have your phone while you're working, and people will sneak off and be looking at the phone all day long. And guys, we as Christians, nobody in the room should see us doing those things. If the work says it's wrong, it needs to be wrong to you, and it needs to be vile to you, it needs to be ranted to you, and you need to pray, Lord, make that line so definite in my heart that I have no desire to cross them, especially in the eyes of you and the people who are watching me. Because I want to represent you, the power of your resurrection, the fellowship of your suffering, and I want your glory to shine forth in me every step that I take, every word that I say. Is that our heart? Jesus commanded it that it be. He prayed it in John 17 that it would happen for himself then he prayed for his 11 disciples. One had already ran off. One had already been demon-possessed, filled with the devil himself. And he was sitting there at the table of the Lord, at the fellowship of the Lord. He had just had his feet washed by the very God of heaven. And he looks over at Jesus, and Jesus looks over at him, and Jesus says, hey, buddy, what it is you've got to do, why don't you go ahead and be quick about it. And the Bible says immediately Satan enters his body, he grabs the money bag and walks out for one purpose, to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus already lost one. He lost a multitude before that, and now he's left with 11 fellows. And he lets them know that he's been convinced that he can now trust them, that they are ready for the message of the gospel. I hope that's every one of you in this room. I hope God can look at you in the face and say, I am convinced in your discipleship. I can trust you with my word. Now get out there and go share it. I love you. And he said, oh, by the way, in about the next hour, you guys are all going to flee from me. You guys are all going to give up. You're, you're going to quit momentarily, but I, I, I'm going to let you know that it won't be permanent. Praise God for that. We fail along the way, but God in us won't let it be permanent if you won't let it be permanent. If you pray and say, God, please bring me back to, bring me back to the fold. I don't want to be out there in the darkness. I don't want to be out there in the world. I don't want to be in sin. I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be misrepresenting you. I want, like Jesus wanted, your glory to shine forth in me. And he prayed that for his disciples. And then he said, Lord, I pray not these, Father, only for these 11, but I pray for everybody who's going to come behind them for the next 2,000 years and believe and be part of this family of ours and be true disciples. I pray for them. He prayed for us. He prayed for you. Guys, we've been emphasizing for the last several weeks, it is important that you be an answer to Jesus' prayer, not a hindrance of that prayer. It's important that you go along with his word. That's why you must have the word in you so you'll do what it says. You'll walk alongside of it as the Holy Spirit does us. Remember, he's the paraclete. He's the one who comes beside us and works. And he's the one that keeps us on the straight and narrow. He's the one that keeps reminding us about who God is and God's goodness and his glories and what we should be doing and how we should confess. And when he comes against us and says, you've been wrong, you've been wrong, you've been wrong, we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And we remain teachable. Guys, you need to pray right now. Lord, give me a teachable heart. Give me a teachable spirit. Whenever you come to me with some news that is from your book, I want to learn it. I want to know it. I don't want to think I know everything. And when the truth comes, say, bah, you're kind of, you know, you're kind of, you know, old-fashioned in that. No, Lord, I want to have a teachable spirit. Teach me. Teach me, oh God. Teach me your paths. Teach me your ways. Teach me. I want to know. Guys, he's a great teacher. And if you'll say, teach me, he'll do some teaching. The problem is some of his students are a little slow. And God's calling us to catch up to his teaching. And aren't you thankful he comes to us at our level and teaches us where we are? 
Aren't you thankful that when we fall into the ditch, you'll come to where we are in that ditch and lift us up and say, come on now, we need to keep going from where we fell, where we've, where we've fallen short, come on. And he teaches us over and over. But we must be teachable as he's teaching. Pray for that spirit, Lord, teach me. And when you teach me, give me, give me a big, big high caliber of do. I want to do what you're teaching. I don't just want to hear what you're teaching. I want to do what you're teaching. And I want to do it with passion, Lord. Please help me. <clears throat> you'll be an answer to his prayer in John 17 if you'll do that. And so he just finishes praying. And he says, boys, it's time to go pray. What? Jesus just finished his praying, the longest prayer in the New Testament. And he says, okay, guys, in the name of Jesus, God bless you, Father. Amen. All right, guys, time to go pray. And that's where we find ourselves today in this verse. Then Jesus, then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Hey, you eight, you guys sit right here while I go pray yonder. He goes from prayer to prayer, from prayer to prayer, from prayer to prayer. Paul picks it up and he says, Guys, do you understand that in the kingdom of heaven it is vital that you learn to pray always? Quit complaining. Quit having uh, discussions that are so vain and empty that get you nowhere on this planet. We were talking about Christian radio station. And in the morning they have talk shows just like the secular radio stations. And their talk is filled with fluff. Hey, when your children go to school and they're encountered by this, well, what's your opinion on it? Let us hear your opinion on it. Your opinion don't mean nothing. Your opinion ain't going to change nothing. You need to be praying about the problems instead of sharing your opinion about it. And um, Christian radio has gone the same vein as secular radio, guys. We're vain and we're empty. And that's what the preacher was telling us in the book of Ecclesiastes, man. Don't you know that everything on this planet is vain? It's empty. Even the conversations, even if they're not sinful and satanic and whatever, it's vain unless it's bringing glory to the kingdom of heaven. Unless it's bringing people to that kingdom, unless we're edifying and encouraging people, your life is vain unless it's done in Christ Jesus, man. It's empty. And that's what the smartest man that ever lived told us who lived a life of vanity. He had everything. He had mansions. He had gold. He had silver. He had ivory. He had his own zoo at his palace. The Bible says he spent, Solomon, seven years in building the temple of God, that magnificent, awesome, wonderful temple of Solomon. <clears throat> But he spent 13 years building his own house. And that's one of the things about Christian work. We'll do things for God, but more of it's for me. I gave God seven, but I'm keeping 13. And God says, give him all. Otherwise, it's all vanity. Is there even a temple of Solomon that exists today? Is there even a palace of Solomon that exists today? He put all his work into these things. And look what my hands have built. And they can't even be found. You can't even find dust of them. Because all is vanity on this planet apart from Jesus Christ. That's what he told us in the book of Ecclesiastes. All is vanity. And he went through the things that are vain, vain. This is empty. This will burn up. This is garbage. This is trash. Not bad stuff. Just stuff without God. In the very last two verses, he says, I need you to hear the conclusion of your life, pal. You need to listen to me. And you need to listen hard. This is the conclusion. Learn to fear God and respect Him every second of the day. Always know that He's present. Always know that He hears. Always know that He wants to hear from you. Know that He wants you praying. And you must know that He is going to answer the prayer you prayed according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Otherwise, it's all vain. He says, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Reverence God, fear God, and keep His commandments. Hold His word in highest regard. Your life is vain unless this is number one. If this ain't number one in your life, you have lived 168 hours of emptiness that will not exist forever and ever and ever. And God wants you to have every one of those seconds, every one of those minutes existing and to be rewardable for eternity. See, if you did something for the Lord this week, it, Lord, just don't give you your, your little old pat on the back like mankind does. Good job, pair brother. God's going to reward you eternally for what you did for Him in that moment of time because it was pure for Him. He's going to reward those who diligently seek Him. God seeks to reward you. The enemy wants to take it all away. He wants to steal your crowns. He wants to steal the glory. He wants to have you do godly things without the power of God backing you up in those things. That's what Paul told us. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Of such, stay away from those kind of folk. And that's where the church in America is today. We talk godly. We spit out the Bible verses. We do this. God bless you, brother. But there's no power of God there. And God says you learn, need to learn to differentiate between those who are acting godly and those who are godly. And you need to hang out with those who 
are godly, and from those people who are acting godly, stay far away from them. Because you'll take on their characteristics, and their whole characteristic is vanity, emptiness, lies, deceit, themselves being deceived, and deceiving others. When you get in that word of God, it will not deceive you. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man throws out there in the world, that's the harvest you're going to have. So why don't we sow righteousness? And they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that cry over the things that breaks God's heart. Blessed are they who consider, not all weekend, how much fun you're going to have and you're going to watch the baseball game and then we've got the World Series coming up and football kicks off and then we're about to come down to the final of, of the NASCAR and all this other jazz and basketball and blah, 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 blah. And we've got all these things filling our lives. Meanwhile, Jesus is so interested in that little three-year-old crying with his hands in his mouth over in Syria. He doesn't have a mama. And the guards, the mean men, are being so mean to him when God says, don't you dare be mean to these kids, man. I am going to have retribution on you when you mistreat them like that. See, our heart needs to be with God on this. We need to be where he is in this whole matter. And quit living our lives <laughs> filled with this. Because he said it's about to go, bro. When you see what happened to Noah in his day and everybody was doing that which was right in his own eyes and nobody cared about what God wanted and they were living to the next day and eat, drink, be merry for tomorrow we may die. Maddie was telling me that's, that's the idea they have even in their school. Jesus started high school. And their whole idea is, guys, get the best out of today. Just squeeze every bit of juice out of today because you don't know if you'll even have tomorrow. And Jesus Christ says, quit worrying about squeezing juice out of grapes of wrath. It's important that we humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, what is it you want? Squeeze every drop out of me for your kingdom. You squeeze me, Lord. You press me, Lord. Please. And that's where we see Jesus right here. Then cometh Jesus with them to a place called Gethsemane. That's called the Olive Press. Gethsemane means the Olive Press. They had just left the hustle and bustle of Jerusalem. Remember, it's Passover. All the men have come in from out of town, 15 miles radius. They are commanded to come in and be there in Jerusalem. Some, some Jews, the place was too long for them to come, so they sold their harvest, they sold their things, and then they came without all their goods and party goods and everything to Jerusalem. And they stood before the Lord and they had a party before the Lord. But the people were coming. And this night, while Jesus was leaving, while he had been praying, there's been little fires all the way through town from all the guests that have come in for the Passover. It is said that 200,000 sheep will have been slaughtered on tomorrow, tomorrow's day, on Passover. There was one sheep usually per, per 10 people. And there was 2 million people in that town and 200,000 sheep being slaughtered that next day. So there was a hustle and a bustle. There was a buzz going on about this holiday that they had every year. People seeing old friends they hadn't seen since the last Sukkot, you know. And now we're coming back. We're going to see you. We're going to hang with that family here in Jerusalem. We're going to be staying with you. We're going to be staying in the same hotel we stay in every year. And we're going to be doing what we did last year. And there's this hustle and bustle and people staying up late. And at this very night, they did something different. At the temple at midnight, the gates were wide open. Boom! And people had access to the temple at midnight that night because it is now Passover day. And there was a hustle and bustle and there was flames lit that normally wouldn't lit and Jesus goes to a place where he always goes away from the hustle and bustle and tonight the hustle and bustle is greater. The noise is greater. Guys, God calls us away from the noise. And what does Satan bring into our lives? TV, television, news, music, noise, 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 noise. And Elijah was there and along came the earthquake. You guys know that men make earthquakes now. And along came the storm. And you know that men make storms now, harp, geoengineering. And God wasn't in those things. And along came the fire. They can shoot lightning out of the sky and they can catch fields on fire without even being present. He says, but then there came something that man cannot duplicate. That was the still, small voice of God. God was there. And Satan has made all this noise and all this fire and all these storms and all this whirlwind and all this hubble bubble thing going on to keep us from listening to the small, still voice of God. And in that small, still voice of God is where the power of God resides. And Jesus got himself away from the noise into a place called the Olive Press. That is where the fruit has to be destroyed so the precious olive oil can come forth. Olive oil was used in lighting lamps. It was used in food. Extra virgin was the first one of the year that came through. So Jesus would go to this place. Now, 
Jerusalem is a concrete jungle pretty much. It's a small place, but where you can find buildings to live, people have buildings to live and they stack it on top of each other. This garden was a special place. It was an olive grove and it had to be privately owned. Many people, scholars, think that John Mark, the guy that wrote the book of Mark, his father owned this particular olive press. And we see in another passage later when the bad guys came and Judas came to betray with the kiss, that one boy had a garment on and he ran off naked. And many people believe that was to be John Mark himself, who later became a companion of Paul in the missionary journey and then later with Barnabas and later wrote the scriptures for us. And it was at his mother's house where they were praying when Peter was in jail to be free. Big family here, and this man loaned Jesus a praying spot. Jesus had a borrowed garment that he was wearing when he was crucified. He didn't have a house. He borrowed other people's pillows. He borrowed the garden to sleep in to pray in all night. People bless Jesus with things. <clears throat> Do you think any of those people are bummed right now that they blessed Jesus with things while he was here? That they gave him of their best? No, you can use my garden any night. You can use my olive press any night. You can stay at my place. You can pray. You can do the will of the Father. Guys, the most amazing prayer took place at this location. Aren't you thankful for a fellow that donated his stuff to the kingdom of heaven? So you and I can be blessed, not just now, but in eternity because of it. Here's Jesus at Gethsemane, man. And he's there. And he himself is about to be pressed. And he saith unto the disciples, Hey, you eight guys, sit right here. I'm going to go pray yonder. And he took with him his inside crew, his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They were the two sons of Zebedee. And he took them with him, and he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. He took these three guys on two other occasions, only them. Remember Jairus' daughter? She lay a dying, she was dead. And he said, Peter, James, and John, I want you guys to go with me. And they got there closer, and they had the mourners there in front of the house, and they were crying, oh, she's dead, she's dead, she's dead. And they were just mourning, mourning, mourning. Jesus says, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. And they laughed. Ha, <laughs> this guy's nuts. And the Bible says, and he got all of them out of there and said, get out of here. Get out of the house. Mom and Dad, you stay in the house. Peter, James, and John, you guys come with me. Wouldn't it have been wonderful, wonderful privilege for Jesus to look at you and say, hey, I need you to come with me. I need all the laughers and all the scoffers and everybody out of the house, but I need you. I need your faith. I need your witness. I need your belief. John was a disciple that Jesus loved, and he believed, he believed, he believed, he believed. Guys, it's very possible that John might be one of the witnesses that comes back. You know, he's in the list with Enoch, Elijah, and John. Jesus said, it's very important. I, I, got, I got many nations you need to speak to further. We have no record of John dying. There is no tomb of John anywhere. The list goes on and on and on. It's very possible that John was this guy and Jesus was setting him up. What is one of the requirements of, of the uh, witnesses who comes to call fire down from heaven? Remember John and James was there and they said, Jesus, these guys ain't acting like us. Do you want us to call fire down? They knew they had the power to do it. Jesus says, no, you're a little bit early on that, brah. Let's not do that just yet. If they ain't against us, man, they're for us. Okay? But they knew they had the power to do it. It's very possible that that's who this is. We know that the two other guys were martyred for Jesus Christ. James was thrown off a building and run through with a sword, John's brother, and Peter was crucified upside down. These guys would gave their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ knew they would, and he had special ministry for them while they lived, and he said, I need all the scoffers away, and I need you three men of faith with me. Bam. One night there at Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi is where they worship Pan, where they worship Satan. And he was showing me that too. A lot of the videos right now are singing about Pan, the musical Pan, and, and all the songs are about, it's about Satan. Pan is Satan. We knew that in the Super Bowl and we saw the Panthers playing. It was a whole ritual unto Pan. And it's still living right now. And they're singing about Pan. I just want to be a little boy of magic and I want to take me away and it just be me, you and Wendy and all this. And, and the list goes on. And it's so ritualistic and it's so satanic people don't even know what they're hearing. They're just following the Pied Piper straight to hell. That's what's happening in America today. And Jesus Christ said, I need three fellows who won't follow the piper. And he was right there at Pan's location where Pan was worshipped, Satan was worshipped. There was just worship of idols going on all along that location, Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus said, guys, let's climb a mountain right here, man. And they climbed the mountain that night. And he said, you guys, you nine, you stay right here. Peter, John, James, you guys come with me. And they walked up the Mount of Transfiguration that night. Jesus had three guys he could trust with him. 
And on that night, they were praying and praying and praying up in the snowy capped mountains up there, Mount Hermon. And they were praying right there on the border of Syria and Israel. It's in the news right now. And Jesus was up there and he was praying with his guys and they fell asleep. But all of a sudden, shows up Elijah and Moses and Jesus is glowing in the dark. And these three guys wake up and they see the glory of God and it all happening there. Boom, it was, wow, and Peter just started talking things that just didn't need to be said. But Peter was a talker and he talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And Jesus says, no, it's not going to be like that. And then all of a sudden, boom, we see Moses and Elijah gone and the glowing stops and Jesus, boom. And he looks at his three boys and says, guys, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? I can't have you telling anybody about that until I raise from the dead, okay? Peter. <laughs> okay. Because he wanted to tell all. I was there with Jesus when it all happened. But Jesus looked at him and said, I need to have confidence in you guys. Now I'm about to tell you something that nobody else will ever hear until I raise from the dead. I can't have you telling them what we just saw, okay? Two different occasions he calls Peter, James, and John along. And on his third occasion he does the same thing at the olive press, and he's pressed. This time, the ninth guy ain't there. He's already left Judas Iscariot. He's only got eight to stay behind this time, not the nine. And he calls the other three with him. He says, come forward to pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful, very heavy. The Bible says he took them with him and prayed in different passages. Let's look at the next verse here. Verse 38. Then saith he unto him, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. Guys, if you are listening to Jesus right now and you're hearing his voice, you must know that his soul is exceeding sorrowful at this very moment. At this very moment, the soul of God is sorrowful. Blessed are they that mourn with God. His soul is just like it was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, his soul was sorrowful unto death, man. And it says, he saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Guys, I'm about to die. I told you a while ago I'm about to die. Peter stood up and says, oh, no, you're not. And Jesus had to look at him and says, I hear you, Satan. Quit talking like that. My mission was to come to die. My mission was to come shed my blood. My mission was to be here and to be the forgiver of sins, the satiator of souls, the supplier of needs, and it must come by way of my sorrow. You couldn't have joy today unless Jesus suffered sorrow. Jesus took all the sorrow that Satan meant for you and he put it upon himself. And he said, I'll be sorrowful for them. And he said unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. I need you to stay right here and watch, guys. Watch. This word in the Greek, the Greek has many tenses. You and I have a past, present, future, sometimes a future perfect, past perfect. These guys had a lot more tenses than that. This word right here is given to us in the present you got to do this indicative. It's called the present indicative. You've got to do this not right now. It's imperative. The present imperative. Do it now. So the present is right now. And now. And now is the present. My first now was the past, but we're living in the eternal present. And God says, I need you to always be watching without ever stopping. Every present moment you find yourself in, which is the next second, the next second, now it's present. Now it's present. We are to be watching. And I need you three guys to be watching. My soul is exceeding sorrowful. And you know what, guys? Only the watchers who are watching right now knows how God's heart is so sorrowful right now. Everybody else thinks he's, oh, he's a blessed, wonderful God. He's going to bless us, bless us, bless us, bless us. I'm here to tell you his heart is sorrowful. His heart is enraged against those that have come against him, that have hurt the little ones, that have despised the widows and the orphans. His heart is enraged, and he's given America blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. And America gets to go to the lake, and we enjoy the lake, and we enjoy the boat, and we enjoy the skis, and we enjoy the jet skis, and we enjoy the little lake house, and we enjoy the weather, and we don't enjoy the presence of God. We like the creation, but up the Creator. Romans 1 says, dude, you're in danger. And you think like that. We love the blessings, but you know what? A, a blesser. I mean, none of a whatever, you know. He's cool with me. I'll call him when I need him real bad. And Satan manipulates it a lot to where folks just don't need him real bad. Because watch you always know that I need him real bad every morning. Every every day. Every thought, every process. I need to pray continually. Watch continually. And the Bible says, 
He said unto them, guys, my soul is terribly, terribly sorrowful. He's talking to his three best friends. He's talking to guys that saw him glow in the dark, the glory of God come upon him. He saw him raise people from the dead. He saw them being included in groups where everybody else was excluded. They were a personal posse of the Lord in his inner circle. And he says, guys, oh, my heart's broke. Please, 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 please. He says, I need you to know that my heart is weary and sorrowful unto death. Stay right here, and I need you to do one thing. Just watch. Just watch. Be alert. Be alert. Next verse. Verse 39. And he went a little further. Didn't he go far enough already? I mean, he left glory to come to Galilee. He lived there as a nobody in Galilee as a carpenter. He was virgin born. He came that way. Didn't he do enough? He stayed there unknown for 30 years. He astounded the preachers when he was at age 12, but he still went back to be the carpenter in the carpenter shop. He lived life there in Bethlehem and Nazareth and Egypt. He was always on the run, always on the fly, and he stayed right there. Wasn't that enough that he just lived a good life? He said, nope. He did his first miracle up there in Galilee, turning the water into wine. He said, I got more to do. And that three and a half year journey took him from Galilee this very moment we're talking Gethsemane and he got to the door and it's about to be time to, for the olives to be pressed and he told his eight guys you guys stay here I got a little place to go and he brought his boys right there a little farther and he said you guys just stay right here I'm very sorrowful I, my heart is so heavy right now all I'm asking you to do is just stay on the watch man watch out for Satan watch out for his bait watch out for his tactics watch out man and he went a little farther the Bible tells us in the book of Luke that he went a stone's throw farther. Luke was the one that wrote about Stephen, the first martyr, being stoned to death. He understood that stone was a term of death. He's the one that gave us in the book of Acts the stoning of Paul by the Iconiums, people of Icon Iconia. And he was stoned. He understood that stone was an instrument of death. And as he's writing that in his book, he says, he went a little farther about a stone's throw. And Jesus was there at the location at death's door, man. And that's where he stopped, right at the face of death. He can trust his three boys back there because they're doing what he's commanded of them. He's asked them. He's given them a mission. He's given them a call. He's given them his method. He's given them his way. He's given them his word. And he goes on a little farther. Man. And then we see him going from this Gethsemane to Gabbatha. That was the place of Pilate's in his court. And he goes from Gabbatha to the grave and then from the grave back to glory. And he kept going farther. Ain't you thankful that Jesus didn't quit? On you? Aren't you thankful that when it got so heavy on him that he didn't bail? Aren't you thankful that when his heart was so sorrowful that he didn't say, Oh, I'm just going to give up. This, this life is just too rough for me. But he went a little farther, guys. God's called everybody in this room to go a little farther. Don't you quit. If you faith the day of adversity, your strength is small. Go farther. Advance. 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 And the key is when you get to where you're going, pray. And he fell on his face being sorrowful. And he went a little farther and he fell on his face. Guys, the very God of heaven, when he created the world, on day three he created dry, dry land. On day six he went down to that dry land and he formed man in his own image and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. 4,000 years later he becomes one of those men after the image of Adam to save everybody who was of the descendants of Adam, of the lineage of Adam. And now we find the man God the God who came and he tabernacled himself in human flesh, made of dirt, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and now we see him in absolute humility with his face to his beginning point, the ground, the dirt, dirt to dirt, meeting with God. And guys, God's called his people to be a people who will come face to face with the ground in the presence of the Lord. Instead of standing all erect and tall and great and proud and I ain't got time to pray. Hey, go a little farther. Just go a little farther in your walk, will you, in obedience? Know what God expects and just do it, will you? Time is short. Jesus did it as an example so you and I can learn that we can do it too. And he found himself, like many of the prophets of old, on their faces before the Lord. When you get in the presence of Almighty God and you really see him high and lifted up, you will hit the dirt, bro. That's what Jesus did. The very glorious God of heaven who humbled himself in the clothing of mankind in an earth suit made after the likeness of Adam. God made Adam in his form, and then he became in the likeness of Adam. What humility, what greatness, and how we should be so grateful for that. 
And his soul was so sorrowful, man. He's got those guys back there, got, got his back. He's got a th stone's throw farther into the olive grove, praying under the trees before his father on his face in exceeding sorrow, saying, Oh, my father, if it's possible, please let this cup pass from me. Now, guys, when you know the Bible, you know that in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Revelation, the cup is a bad thing. The cup is always the judgment, the wrathful judgment of Almighty God on a wicked people. And Jesus knew that He was about to become the sins of all those wicked people. And God's indignation and wrath, His cup of jealousies and rage, was going to be poured out on Him alone for our sake so we could be set free from it. And He knew it. And His fleshly part that was there face down to the ground said, Papa, please! Please, if there's any other way, let's not do this. And it wasn't the fact that he was scared of the pain and the crucifixion. Many people went through pain and crucifixion. Many people loved it. Many people went willingly. We got movies like Braveheart, Freedom, and they're allowed to die in freedom. Hey guys, there is no freedom apart from Jesus Christ. Don't let movies sway you in a, oh, I want freedom. Yeah, Jesus is that freedom. The devil's always offering us what God only can offer without God. And they never can deliver on it. And here's Jesus, greater than Braveheart, and he's there, but he's saying, Oh, I understand this cup. I know the dregs that I'm about to drink. I know the awfulness. I know the wrath, the, the enraging anger of you, Father, that's going to be poured out on me here in seconds, in hours. Oh, please let this pass. But he goes on farther. He goes on farther. And he says, Oh, nevertheless... Not what my flesh is wanting at this moment, but what your will is wanting. I want your will, guys. If your desire is not the will of God, you're doing it wrong. And you're not going farther. You're stopping where you are. You've fallen, and you can't get up. And you'll never get up unless you start watching and praying. God's called you to the place to watch and pray and be faithful. And there is Jesus all alone. Yeah, he had the crowds there, but when he said at the bread of life discourse that I'm God, he that eateth of me shall never hunger again. People just didn't like that, and they walked away. He ends up with 12 guys and says, what about you guys? Are you going to go away? Peter says, you have the gift of life. You have the words of life. Where else shall we go? We have nowhere to go. We've left all and followed you. Now, that 12 has been whittled down to 11. And Jesus leaves eight of them at the gate, and he brings three of them with him and says, you guys stay right here. I'm going to go farther. And he went farther, and he prayed. And he says, Lord, Papa... My humanness feels like stopping here. But I don't want to stop. I want to complete my mission you've called me to on this planet. Not my will. Nevertheless, not my will. Yours be done. Continuing on. Verse 40. And he cometh unto the disciples. He came back. He'd been praying. He'd gone a stone's throw away. He's over there praying. He's before the Lord. He's just, we know that he's sweating drops of blood. We're told in another passage. He was under so much strain, the capillaries in his blood vessels were breaking and it was making its way through his sweat. And he's sweating blood. The stress is so great on him. And he comes back to these guys that he can trust. They're in his inner circle and they're all passed out sleeping. They just sang some great songs, the Hallel. They sang, man, Psalm 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118. We just sang. We had a ball. We had a blast tomorrow, man. It's going to be a big festivity. It's going to be Passover. And uh, the Lord's asked us to watch. Boom, he got it out. He went and prayed. He was gone away. He went further. And when he came back, his chosen were dead asleep. That's the church today. He's gone away. He's about to come back. And the people he put his word into to trust them with his word. To trust him with his life. This word is life. Like dead asleep. They're dead asleep. And in mercy, what does he do? He says, and he comes to the disciples and he finds them dead asleep. And he says to the mouth of the bunch, who said, I will be with you forever. I will hang out. I will chase you to hell and back. I'll defend you to the end. Da, 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 da. And because he was the most boastful, Jesus has to talk to the mouth in the crowd. And that's how we do and when we have to confront folks. You have to go to the, to the spokesman, the one who's, who's bringing it. And you have to bring them down to the humbleness of where Jesus found himself before the throne of the Almighty God. And we do that. We do that first. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Buddy, could you just not watch with me for one 
hour. He already told them an hour ago. He said, within well, this next hour, you all are going to flee from me. It's just going to be an hour. That's all he said. He warned them. It's just going to be an hour. It's going to be within an hour. And he took them all down to where they's going, and that involved a walk. That involved going crossing the river. By this time, the brook Kybron was overflowing. It's the overflowing season of the rains up north coming down. And so they had to work their way through that. They finally got the, the praying spot. Jesus assigned everybody their spots, gave them commands in their spots. I'm going to go farther, but I'll come back. And I want to find you the way I left you, with the orders that I gave you. You eight stay here, you three stay here, and you three I need you to watch. And he goes on and he does his business and he comes back. And they ain't doing what he's asked them to do. Are you doing what God's asked you to do? Do you know it? Do you know it? Have you continued in it? Have you gone farther with what God told you to do? Have you given up? Have you quit? Have you passed out on him? Time to wake up. It's time to wake up, church. Wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Do your part. Do what God's called you to do. Take your gifts and utilize them. Produce fruit. At least 30-fold. God has called you and given you assignment, and Satan showed up in your garden like he did Eve's. He showed up while you was given your assignment. Your assignment, Eve, was not to touch that tree. Don't eat of that fruit. And the snakes showed up in that garden. And God's called you in the garden of prayer with Him. He's just a stone's cast away. Isn't that beautiful? God's never far away from you. He left us, but He's not far away. He's right here, and He can hear us talking. He can hear us crying. He can hear us whisper. He can hear your heart without your mouth moving. Isn't that the most beautiful thing? And He's given you a command in His Word to do His bidding, and the snake shows up. And the snake showed up there in Gethsemane just like the snake showed up there in Eden. And he's showing up in the garden of your, your prayer spot, the place God has assigned you to be quiet, to watch, and to wait. You see, guys, watching and praying is vital. Watching and praying. Watching will help you sight the enemy. And praying will help you fight the enemy. And the reason the enemy is not being fought in your life is because you don't know where he is in your life. You ain't looking for him. You ain't seen him. Why do y'all talk about the devil up in there? Because I need to know where he is, man, so I can pray against this cat, so I can have victory, man, so I can go on farther with Jesus. Amen. I don't want to be left at the gate with the eight. I want to come forward with the three. I want to be there, man. I want to be the first one he sees when he comes back on his way to the gate. The first three he saw was the three he left there closer to him. That's who he's coming back for. He's coming back for the three who he can trust with his word. At times we find ourselves sleeping. This is not the time to sleep. Amen. It's time to watch and wait. It's time to sight and fight. That's what we do in the kingdom of heaven. In love, in joy, in peace. You really want to anger hell? Be sweet to mean folks. You really want to rile them up and pour coals on their head? Pray for those that despitefully use you, persecute you, and say all men of evil against you falsely. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You're in good company, bro. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You want to win this thing? you got to identify the snakes in your garden. Amen. That's through watching and prayer. Jesus Christ comes back and he finds them all dead asleep. And he looks at the mouth and he looks at the preacher. This guy is going to be used of God. That's why he had to get with him. You go to people that you know God can use well, and we see that Satan's utilizing this, this usability right now. And you want to go warn them. You say, listen, dude, you got to wake up. you got to wake up. Because in 53 days, this guy, he's telling to wake up to watch and pray. is going to preach the most magnificent sermon ever preached. And on that day, 3,000 souls will come to the Lord. There will be signs and wonders taking place. The gift of tongues will be introduced. He'll be speaking in the Aramaic language in 17 nations who came to Jerusalem that day for that weekend, for unleavened bread, are going to hear the gospel for the first time in their languages, and then they go home, and they're going to take that gospel message in their language and share it with everybody. The 17 languages are mentioned in Acts chapter 2. God had to wake him up first. Do you want to be used of the Lord greatly? You need to wake up. Do you want to be used of the Lord greatly? You need to pray. Oh, I pray in the morning, I pray at night before I go to bed. How about this? How about you pray presently? like God commanded us to do. I pray now, and I pray now, and I pray without ceasing. Because the devil needs to be fought at all measures at every minute of the day. We need to watch. We need to pray. And he came to the disciples, and he found them all dead asleep. And he woke them up. Pete. Pete. Get up, buddy. Buddy, I really need you. 
I need to watch. But... Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus only gives command because He knows what's next. These guys didn't understand it. They didn't understand His grieving heart. He told them, but they didn't get it. They, their belly was satisfied, America. They had what they needed. They, they was at pleasure. They weren't wanting for anything. They were there, had it good. Who cares what Jesus wants? Jesus is grieving. That's cool. I'm not. Sorry about Jesus. We need to start feeling what Jesus feels. He comes and he says, Peter, please, I need you to wake up, man. Could you not just pray with me one hour? Verse 41. Watch and pray. Sight and fight. Sight and fight. Sight the enemy. Fight the enemy. Sight the enemy. Fight the enemy. Sight the enemy. Fight the enemy. Christians, they can't even sight the enemy. We, we hear catchphrases on Oprah and other shows and we start calling our sin after titled names that maybe this pill can help or, or this uh, remedy can help and I can just cower down to uh, you know what everybody's teaching in my psychology class at college and I can, I can go ahead and have victory apart from Jesus. I don't need to watch and pray why I can go to the pharmacy. I can go to the pharmacy and get fixed. And that's where we come to and Jesus gave us that great warning in Revelation. Because I need to know that everybody who trusts in the pharmacy will not be in the kingdom of heaven. Pharmakia, sorcery, it's witchcraft. I, I need I need to feel better. I need an incantation to take me from this, this altered spot to a different spot. And that's witchcraft. That's the witch's brew. And we see you meeting up at the pharmacy. God says you guys got to quit trusting in the pharmacy and start trusting in the Lord. You got to quit trusting in oh, the beauty of the garden and start looking for the snakes in that garden and start sighting and fighting this enemy of yours because he wants to devour you. He's seeking to devour you. He's seeking you. It's time for us to seek him out. That's the watching and the praying. We'll seek and destroy in the name of Jesus. Watch and pray. Why? So you will not enter into sin. So you will not enter into temptation. Jesus was over there praying, praying, praying for himself. The devil's coming to him. The devil's been coming to him. The devil came to him three and a half years earlier and said, I will give you the kingdoms without a cross. How does that deal sound? Jesus said, no, I came to get the kingdoms by way of a cross. And this is the deal I'm sticking to. By the shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood, there will be no forgiveness, no remission, no covering of sin, and I've come to do that. Jesus carried out his will, and he went on a little farther in it. A little farther in it, he left glory, went through hell, and ended up in glory again. Aren't you thankful for that? You ever walked through life and it's been like hell? Keep walking. Go a little farther. <clears throat> Don't quit where you are. Go a little farther. Fall on your face before the Holy One in prayer and say, Lord, please, God, help me. I want to do your will. I want to know your will. I want to fight your will. And you watch and you pray and you watch and you pray and you watch and you pray and you sight and you fight. So the day he comes back and gets you and you find yourself too in glory. And when he comes back to you, oh, wouldn't it be great to be one of those who wouldn't sleep in? Wouldn't it be great to, one of those who, to be one of those who watched the whole time he said to watch and pray and now you're going to do that until you see him again? He's coming soon. It could be in a week from now. Be awake. Be alert. Be sightful. Be fightful. And he says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation because the spirit inside you is willing. It's your flesh that's your enemy. It's the, the, the ties that you have to this world. Guys, here's the secret. Let me just let you in on the secret and we can get through this thing. Get rid of this world. You are now a citizen of heaven. You've been born again. This world has nothing to do with you. Let go of everything. Everything. Cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it. Nothing drags me down. Nothing's holding me down. I belong to heaven. If you'll do that, you'll have a lot of your problems go away. But you we want to hold on to things of this lie. Vanity, vanity, vanity. Jesus Christ says, now I want you to cut the cords, baby. Jesus Christ cut the cords. Because the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. What is your temptation? The snakes gathered around you. If you're supposed to be praying, maybe you've fallen asleep. Wake up. If you're not asleep, praise God and stay awake. Keep watching in this present moment. Keep praying in this present moment without stopping. Just do it presently. Do it presently. Do it presently. Because God's about to come presently. The day He shows up, it would be great for Him to show back up at you. <clears throat> Watching. Praying. Citing the enemy. And destroying him. Because you fought with the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. And you overcame them by the blood of the Lamb. The word of your testimony. You didn't care whether you lived or died in doing this. I got a mission. My mission is to watch and pray. The devil, that's what I'm going to do.